This video shows you how to start up Zeiss Axio Imager 1. Firstly, switch on the three boxes on the right hand side. Then, switch on the microscope power on the lower left. This video shows you how to start up Zeiss Axio Imager 2. Firstly, switch on the three boxes on the left hand side and then remove the ocular cap from the microscope. Now wait for the microscope LCD touch screen on the right to finish booting. This is apparent when the home screen appears. Next, log in to the locally managed acquisition PC using the provided username and password. Then connect to your PPMS booking account to log your usage. To load your sample, use the touch screen load position button to move the stage down. Carefully add your slide to the stage, ensuring it is cover slip upwards and flat. Then use the stage control knobs on the right to move to the area of your slide containing your sample. Return to the approximate focal plane using the left hand up arrow on the touch screen. Click the microscope tab icon and select the 10 times objective. Next, click the home tab and then the Make It Visible button on the lower right of the screen to switch the bright field lamp on and move the light path to the oculars. There is a slider on the side of the microscope which should be pushed in when viewing through the eyepieces and pulled out when using the camera. Focus your sample using the focus knob on either side of the microscope and adjust the lamp intensity if necessary using the knob on the right. Don't forget to remove the anti-reflection disc from the transmission light path underneath the condenser. This video shows you how to use oil immersion lenses on the Zeiss Axio Imager microscopes. Zeiss Immersol oil is classed as a skin irritant. If you react to it, we recommend using gloves to do this, but in our experience very few people have a problem with it. Either way, ensure that your fingers, gloved or ungloved, are clean when using the lens tissue. Under the microscope tab of the touch screen, choose the objective you wish to use that requires oil. The objective nose piece will revolve to the chosen objective and the stage will move down. The touch screen will freeze and ask you to apply the immersion medium to your cover slip. Using the applicator attached to the lid of the oil bottle, collect a small drop of oil on the end and carefully apply a drop to the cover slip directly underneath the objective. Using the touch screen, click done and the stage will move the sample back to the same focal plane it was previously at. Using the oculars, fine tune the focal plane of your sample and then switch off the lamp used to protect your sample. Next, we describe how to remove your sample and clean the objective. Once you've finished imaging, use the load position button on the touch screen to move the stage down. Carefully remove your sample ensuring you don't scratch the objective. Next, take a single piece of lens tissue from the box and fold it in half. Use this to carefully wipe once across the objective lens to remove excess oil. Using a dry corner of the tissue, or a fresh clean one, wet it with ethanol from the supplied dropper bottle, and once again wipe the objective lens to remove any residual oil. Finally, take a clean dry piece of lens tissue Fold it in half and wipe the lens to remove any alcohol residue. Lastly, wipe any spillages from the microscope stage. Click the left hand up arrow on the touch screen to move the stage back to the working position. We will be using the Zeiss software Zen Blue to acquire images with the Axio Imager microscopes. Double click on the icon to start it, then click Zen Pro. If it asks you to calibrate the stage, go ahead and click Calibrate Now. We will start by describing the layout of the software. This is the Locate tab that we can use for finding our sample via the oculars or the camera, 
and to check that standings have worked. We'll be spending most of our time on the acquisition tab where we'll create settings specific to our sample and taking our images. I'll also briefly introduce the processing tab. Over on the right hand side, we have some buttons that we can use to change the lens. If you wave the mouse over each one, you can see more information about that particular lens, including the magnification, numerical aperture, working distance, and mounting media, etc. This diagram illustrates the light path within the microscope. It can act as a helpful reference for troubleshooting if what you are seeing through the oculus or the camera is not what you'd expect. Bright field imaging uses this white light as a transmitted source which passes through the shutter when it's open, then through the sample from below. It is magnified by the lens and then directed either to the colour camera here or the eyepieces here. Lens imaging on this microscope uses one of these LEDs as a reflected light source. Light passes through the open shutter to a filter cube. The first filter allows specific wavelengths of light to pass through which then bounce off a dichroic mirror through the lens and to the sample. The light then excites the fluorophores, slows down and is reflected back up through the lens at a longer wavelength. The longer wavelength passes through the dichroic mirror and through a second filter before going to the monochrome camera or the oculus. There are buttons here for switching the transmitted light on and off, and buttons for the reflected light. It's important to remember to switch the light off when you are not actively viewing a sample to minimise bleaching. Here are some buttons for different channels for viewing our sample. The channel contains a setting for a filter, a light source, exposure time and a detector, which will either be our eyes or a camera. Eyes colour is for looking at the sample through the oculus. Monocam is for viewing the sample with the monochrome camera through the software. You can use these buttons to cycle back and forth between the eyepieces and the camera until you have found your region of interest. There are three buttons for phase imaging, and four different filter cube and LED combination options represented by common fluorophore names DAPI, GFP, M Cherry, and Sci Fi. The camera can be changed here. This is the colour camera for bright field imaging, Axio Cam 105. And this is the black and white camera for fluorescence imaging, the Axio Cam MRR3. I'll now show you an example of how to find your sample using this setup in the Locate tab. I'm going to select the black and white camera on the GFP channel and go live. I can adjust the exposure time here. The image is a bit dull, so I'll increase the exposure time a bit to get a better look. I can adjust the focus either using the wheel on the microscope, or I can press control on the keyboard and move the mouse wheel. The speed of the focus and adjustments can be changed using the menu. If you want to increase the contrast of the image without increasing the exposure time to avoid bleaching, I can change the way the image is displayed using this histogram. I will go into more detail about this histogram later in the video. I will now press stop and switch the reflected light off. To view the sample in Brightfield, I will switch to the colour camera, press Brightfield and go live. The image is a bit dim, but I don't need to make it perfect at this stage. You can see that the histogram now has three lines because the colour camera is producing an RGB image. Now we will move on to the acquisition tab where you will likely spend most of your time. We recommend that you create your own experiment where you can save all of your settings. Click here, go to new, and give your experiment a unique name. To create your own channels, go to smart setup. We'll start with an example of a setup for fluorescence imaging. First, we will select the monochrome camera AxioCam MRR3. Next, you will specify which fluorophores are present in your sample. I am using autofluorescent pollen, so I will just pick three common fluorophores DAPI, Alexa488, and 594. I will also add a bright field channel. Including a bright field channel when you are doing fluorescent imaging can be helpful for indicating details otherwise not apparent, such as blebbing. Using our fluorophore information, the software will automatically choose the filter cube and light sources required. It doesn't make any difference if you pick fastest or best signal here because this microscope is a wide field system, so press OK.
We will now optimise our channels per the brightness of our sample by adjusting the light intensity and the exposure time. If I go live, you can see that we are using about a quarter of the histogram. I will now give a short explanation as to what the histogram is showing. A digital image is comprised of pixels. Each pixel is an individual sample point on the camera sensor. In a monochrome camera, the sensor is measuring light intensity. The scale on which the camera is able to determine the light intensity is the bit depth. The camera we are using here has a bit depth of 12, which means the light intensity can be measured on any of the 2 to the power of 12 scales of grey, which is 4096 scales of grey. If the camera detects no light at all at a particular pixel, then the pixel will have a value of 0. If the light intensity is at the camera sensor's maximum capacity, it will have a value of 4096. Coming back to the histogram, the x-axis shows the scales of grey, and the y-axis shows you how many pixels are measuring at each particular light intensity. You want all of the pixels in your image to fall within the measurable range. Specifically, you want to avoid saturation, which occurs in pixels measuring at 4096. As a result of the excitation light intensity being too bright and or the exposure time being too long for your sample. We can use range indicator to show underexposed areas in blue and overexposed areas in red. At the moment everything's within a measurable range so the image in the live window is completely monochrome. If I increase the light intensity here to 100%, and the exposure time by typing in the time in milliseconds and hitting enter, we now have some overexposed areas. This means we have lost structural details about our sample and this image would be unusable for intensity comparisons because the intensity readings have gone off the chart. Our sample is also at a higher risk of bleaching. I'm now going to leave the light intensity at 100% and take the exposure time down. This would be a usable image, but I will take the exposure time down lower as I do not need to fill up that much of the histogram. The benefits of keeping the exposure time to a minimum are reducing the effects of bleaching, reducing overall imaging time, which is something to keep in mind for tiling and Zestex, which we will come back to later, and for if you are intending to do intensity comparisons using the same settings, it gives you more wiggle room in the measurable zone if subsequent samples are brighter. We also recommend that when you are creating your settings that you start with what you anticipate to be your brightest sample. If you want to increase contrast to aid visualisation or without increasing light intensity or exposure time, you can change the way the image is displayed. To do this, adjust the minimum and maximum range of the histogram. This will not alter the data you are capturing. You can also use the mouse to digitally zoom in and out. I am happy with these settings for the Daffy channel, so I will adjust the settings for the other fluorescent channels in the same way. We generally say that if your exposure time is longer than 1000 milliseconds, then we would recommend trying to optimise your staining methodology if it is feasible. If it is not, and you have to use a long exposure time, and your image is still a bit dull and grainy, it may still be usable. For example, if I put the cursor here, the background value is 40. If I put the cursor at the centre of my sample, the value of the pixel is 176. If the question I was answering was, is this pollen fluorescing at 5 mm4, then I can prove that it is sufficiently different from the background to say that it is, even if the image is grainy and not particularly beautiful. This channel can still be optimised, so I will do that now. We will now optimise the bright field channel. As we saw from the light path diagram earlier, Brightfield uses a different lamp, which needs to be at a setting of over 3.8 for it to come on. We will adjust the exposure time in the same way as before. We can expect the required exposure to be much shorter than for our fluorescent channel. We can now go through each of our channels and confirm that our optimised settings have been saved. If we switch off range indicator, we can see the false colours have been applied. These can be changed post acquisition if required. Now I will hit stop and the lights will be turned off. Once you are happy with your settings, you can save them to your experimental profile and you can reuse these for all of your imaging sessions. We will now take an image. Make sure all of the channels you want to be included are ticked, then press snap. 
This is an overlay of all four of our channels. The grey background is a result of combining the white transmitted light and black reflected light backgrounds. If I untick the bright bridge image, we can view just the three fluorescent channels together. To increase contrast, we can press min max to change the way the image is displayed. If you are taking multiple images that you are intending to publish or present, you should set the display scales manually for each channel and keep the channel settings the same across all of your images so that you don't unintentionally misrepresent the differences between your images. You can set the scale by selecting the individual channels and inputting the minimum here and the maximum here. If we click here, we can see a split of each of the channels. And if we click here, we can see the metadata which contains all of the information on how we took our images, including our settings. To save the image, right click, save as CZI, go to data, user underscore data, the month, and make a folder in your name. You should always save your files as CZI in order to retain the metadata. To add a scale bar, we can go to graphics, and go to scale bar. This can be customised using this window. For example, the weight of the line can be changed here, and the text size can be changed here. I'm now going to cover um, taking an image with transmitted light in the colour camera. So we'll select the colour camera there, that's Cam 105, and we're going to add a bright field channel. That's already there. So usually we'll sit down here so you can double click it from there, or as I said before, you can just search for anything you want there. Um, so we close, and we go OK, and I'm going to go live, and we can't see anything at the moment, so we are going to change the attempts to do it at least 4%, that says 40, 4%. Uh, so let's shut off the edge there, first and put on range indicator, you can see it's gone red. Um, the exposure time is much too long, so we're going to change the exposure time to 4. And now we can see our image. Um, so it's in focus, but we can see that it's sort of got a brown beigeness to it. So there's a, a couple of things we can do there. So we can change the white balance. Um, so if we go to... Oops, if we go to an area where there isn't anything there. That will do when we go out of focus. And go auto. And that's changed our white balance. And we can also do a shading correction. So we will put on that, that and we will define it. And that just gives us a flatter image. So before that was maybe slightly darker at the edges, and that's to do with the shape of the lens. And so now when we go back to our sample, hopefully it will be easy enough to find it. Uh, there it is. See that the image is slightly better. I'll just take a snap, see how that looks. That's not too bad. Um, if I press, oh, that's not good. If I press min max, it makes it look, uh, it gives it a slightly more contrast. Um, but that's, you can see that it's still maybe a little bit grainy on the whiteness, on the sort of white background, but we've definitely got rid of those, the beige colouring, and we've got rid of that slightly um, checked effect. Uh, if we want to reuse our settings from the snap that we've taken, we now have this button here that we can highlight. So if we make any changes and we want to go back to what this, the settings that this image was taken with, we can hit reuse. So for example, if I change the light intensity down here, because I'm on this image, I can press reuse, and it's gone back up to 100, so that we, we can reuse those settings. So we're just going to quickly talk about the differences between the Axio Imager 1 and the Axio Imager 2. So I've just got a screenshot of the uh, equivalent locate tab on the Axio Imager 1. Uh, so that's the easiest way to compare them. Um, 
So the first thing to say is the Axiomager one, it does have a slightly better color camera. Um, it's got the Axiocam MRC. Um, so if you're doing your bright field imaging, um, then the Axio one would possibly be the, the one for you. Um, for fluorescence imaging, the Axio two has got these LED light sources, whereas the Axio one has just got a white light light source. Uh, and then there are different filter cubes. Uh, so the reason that the Axio one has got this white light is so that it can work in conjunction with Psi seven, uh, which is a far red. And Axio one is actually the only microscope we have that can do Psi seven. Uh, even with confocals, they don't have that option. Um, so we've got the other um, fluorescence cubes we've got very similar. So we've got the DAPI, the GFP, um, and then we've got the you know the, the red side of things. Um, the Axio two has got more options for phase imaging if you need to do that, whereas Axio one would be your choice for if you need to use DIC. Uh, that is probably it. I personally find for if I need to do tiling, if I need to take a, a sort of a large area, um, the Axio two tends to be uh, slightly quicker for that. Um, the main thing to remember is if you are doing a lot of imaging and you need to compare um, your images from the various uh, sessions that you've had, is to essentially just pick one microscope and then stick with that um, so that the settings that you use will be the same for each of your images um, rather than sort of going between the two. Uh, that is pretty much it I think. So now we're going to talk about tiling. So I've changed my sample over to a, um, a big piece of tissue, it's actually a mouse tissue. Um, I'm sorry, a mouse kidney. Um, I'm just going to use the one channel for this demonstration because when we're tiling we're taking multiple images and it can take quite a long time so I don't want this video to be too long uh, but you can of course if you tick these you can tile with multiple channels I'm just using not to for this demonstration so if I go live I'm still on the 10x uh, I'm going to get it in focus there we go so if I was to do, wanted to do a very simple uh, tile, I can use this drop down menu here, if I go two by two. So you can see it's taking four images. If I zoom in, you can see the joins here. Um, if I wanted to stitch those together, I could quickly show you the processing. So if recently used stitching is always one of the most recently used, but if it wasn't here, you can just type it in here. So, but I'm gonna click stitching here. Um, I'm going to select my image down here, uh, I'm going to leave all of the defaults on, I'm going to apply. Uh, and you can see that you can still see the joins a little bit on here, uh, but I'm going to leave that for now. There's different methods we can use for optimizing, but I'll come back to that. Um, so that's just very simple tiling. Now we're going to use the tiling menu. So I'm going to click tiles. If I scroll down, we have a new menu here, which gives us a lot more control over where, where we're going to tile. So I'm going to go to advanced setup. And we now have another menu here. So we've still got our live window, but we've got advanced setup over here. So I'm going to stay on the live menu for now. Um, so we're going to take a preview image, which is just going to act as a map for the entire area. Uh, and so for the preview image, I'm going to use the lowest magnification so we take the smallest number of images. Um, so you can see it looks very dark, but I've moved this in here. We are collecting enough information to take uh, a fair enough preview image. Um, so I'm not going to increase the exposure time because that will make means it, mean that it will take longer. Um, so this is just for our map so we can get an overview of the entire kidney. Um, so we'll go back to advanced setup here, go back to tiles. Uh, so I'm going to zoom out with the mouse. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a box around this area here, which is equivalent to our live window. So I'm going to go to contour down here in the tile region setup. Um, 
I'm going to draw this here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the settings in the microscope, the actual the wheels in the microscope, to move the sample around. So I found the top. So I'm going to drag this down and that now marks the top. So I want to find all the far edges of this kidney. So this, now this, our entire kidney should be contained in this area. So the yellow line marks, this is the area that we have marked. Each of these boxes, each of the squares, will be in an individual uh, snap of the camera. And the overlapping lines show where each of the images will overlap each other. Um, so now I've got an uh, item here in this uh, tile region area. So this is tile region one. So I'm gonna go to preview scan and I'm going to start preview scan and I've confirmed here that it's just using the one channel you want to make sure that it's particularly for a preview scan ideally you just want to preview with the one channel um, so that it won't take too long so you can see it looks very dark but when we can change the display here change the high and the lows and you can see it more easily. Okay, that's finished. So that doesn't take too long. That's because we were using the 5x. Um, so now we can zoom in on this. Um, in fact, we'll go back down here. We'll untick that. That gets rid of the box. We're no longer. We've got our we've got our preview scans. So we're no longer interested in um, taking another image of that. Um, and now we can decide which area of the kidney is of interest. So if you've got an entire um, slide of cells, you can you can quickly tile uh, quite a large area, and then you can pick the regions of interest and take a high quality uh, or high magnification image of those. So I'm just going to use, I've got different contour options down here. I could do another box, I can do a circle. I'm going to use this one here where I can take an image, I can uh, define a specific area. So I am just going to define this area here and then right click. Uh, so this with the 5x would only take nine tiles, but I want to take a more detailed image of this. So I'm going to use the 20x. So you can see how many more tiles there are now. So we wouldn't want to use the 20x for the whole kidney. I mean, if you if you have to take an, if you need to image a whole kidney, you know, be my guess. But if you don't need to, don't use that time. Um, so what we need to do now is we need to make sure that our channel is optimized for the 20x. That's an important step. So you see here, it's, it's got the high numerical aperture. Um, that's going to be a lot brighter than what, how it would be with the 5x. So we need to make sure, if I zoom back out, um, I'm going to move my live window to the center of my box. Uh, I'm going to go live. So you can see that's actually not too bad, but it's also not in focus. So make sure that it's, so yeah, as it's in focus, if I go range indicator, there it's overexposed. Um, so I'm just gonna in fact, use the mouse to get it on top of focus. Range indicator, massively overexposed. Um, so I'm definitely gonna keep my intensity high and keep lower my exposure. So for tiling, that's a good idea because it means it will take less time. So let's go 20. And then 
We've still got a little bit of overexposure of that, so. Yeah, that's fit. So that's how it actually is. That's still a good detailed image there. Just filling up half this range. That will be fine. So, uh, let's go back to our tiling. So what we want to do now is, because this sample is quite thick and uh, slides tend to bend in a certain shape, we don't want to assume that each of these tiles is going to be on the same focal plane. So we are going to put in some support points. And I've just uh, got this area here where the support points will go. Um, so I want to make sure that it's parabolic saddle, at least nine support points. Uh, and then I'm going to use this bit three by three and I'm going to distribute those. So because it's not an exact square, it's not put on nine. So we're going to add on some extra ones. Uh, so add support point. Add support point. If your area is smaller than this, you don't necessarily need all nine. If it's a lot bigger and if it's quite variation in sort of thickness, then you might need more. Um, you just have to play it by ear. Uh, so here we've got all our support points listed here. Um, so we need to verify these and set the focal plane for each one. So we're going to verify these. So this comes up this here. We're going to go to the live window. Uh, and then we're going to move to the current support point. So you can see it's massively out of focus. You need to make sure it includes Z when moving to points is ticked. Uh, so we are going to focus each of these. Uh, so I'm going to set Z and move to next. Just do this for all nine. That's all of them. So I'm going to close. So they are all, all our support points are ready to go. So I'll press stop. Um, and now we're going to go start the experiment. So these are the images that are being taken. If we go back here, we can see how oh, it's moving along in our area. This is actually pretty swift, and that's because our exposure time is so low. Quick check whether any of it's overexposed. It's the blue bits at the edge, that's just where we've not taken an image. There's additional options down here. Uh, the default is the over tile overlap to be 10% and that's usually fine, you don't usually need to do anything with that. Um, if you had any difficulties with getting them to overlap, then you could perhaps extend it and make your overlap percentage a bit higher. Um, so this is our image. I'll fix that a bit, that will make it look a bit zingier. So these weird circles, the sample's very old so I don't know what they are. Um, yeah, that looks, looks pretty good. Um, so again, if I wanted to process that, I could come to stitching and set my image and stitch it. You can also do this in a free version of Zen. Um, which might not take very long. So that's it, stitched together. See, it moves it slightly, so you get these bits at the side. It's just where it's shuffled the images to make sure that they match up. So you can't really see the joint in this, so I'm pretty happy with that. That's come out pretty well. So we're quickly going to discuss the use of the aperture. So we still have our mouse tissue here, and we are going to take a quick snap. The aperture is digitally encoded, so the software knows whether it is in place or not. To use the aperture module, Manually push the Aptone slider into the microscope body. You should feel it click into place and it will audibly beep when correctly seated. 
come down to the Aperture menu here. So the default number of images that it takes is five. So that's fine. I'm just going to take a snap with the Aperture. And I go to the Aperture menu here, create image, stick them all together. And you can see the difference that that gives us here. I'll get back to this slide. So if we compare the two, this has a lot more um, grayscale levels. Um, just optimize it like that. Um, so in the grid system, certainly reduce the amount of light being picked up. Um, but this this one here has a lot more unfocused light. So if I zoom in, you see this haze, the green haze, that's the unfocused light. So if I zoom in here, it's a lot crisper. Um, so the avatone we would not use for measuring the amount of fluorescence, but we would perhaps use it can be helpful for taking structural images. Um, if there's a lot of background noise and you need a fine level of detail with regards to structure, the Apertone can be helpful. To stop using the Apertone, pull the Apertone slider out again until you feel it click into the out position notch. So now we're going to talk about Z stacks. So I'm going to click on the Z stack here and I'm going to scroll down to this menu. So the Z stack is a way of taking a 3D image or it is a way of taking just multiple layers for if you have a particularly uh, thick sample with multiple fo focal planes. If you need a, like a true 3D image, I'd recommend using a confocal microscope. Uh, using it, doing a Z stack on this kind of machine is more helpful for just getting those uh, detail at different focal planes rather than viewing them all at once. Um, so if I want to take a Z stack on here, so I'm going to go live and scroll through one way um, and then I'm going to say set that as first. Doesn't matter which way I go, so I just go slightly out of focus one way and I'm going to set this one as last. So if I want to optimize it to Nyquist, I click this and that recommends setting 83 slices. Um, which, because our uh, exposure time is quite short, that's not too bad. If I wanted to change that, I could have a different interval, or I could go, actually, I only want the interval to be one, and then I'd take less slices, which would take less time, obviously. I'm just going to stick with the optimal one for here, just to show you how that will look. Uh, and so I'm going to press Start Experiment. And it was just going to take us through the sample. So if I just if I want to see my different layers, I can use this bar here. I'll make this a bit brighter, and I will zoom into this one. Um, and then I'll, I can show you through the different layers. So I've made it too thick here. There's not really any useful information at the, beyond this point. Um, you can just go take a trip through this piece of tulip pollen. Um, if I want to view it in a 3D fashion, I can press 3D. And this shows us what we have here. So you can see it's taken a little bit of an hourglass shape. That is because of the way in which the light travels away from the um, item that it's bouncing off. Ensure you have removed your samples and cleaned the objectives used. Now you can close down the software and hardware. Ensure all images are saved, then click the X to close Zen. A warning message will appear telling you Zen service is still shutting down. Wait for this to close before logging off the PC. Power off the three boxes on the right hand side of the microscope and finally replace the ocular cap. Power off the three boxes on the left hand side of the microscope 
then replace the ocular cap and the anti-reflection cover for the transmission arm.